I'm going to start talking a little bit about your relationship to Venezuela. Oh, sure. Yes. Yeah. You were the first non-Venezuelan guest violinist I read. Uh, yeah. And um, later you've conducted the orchestra. Yeah. And uh, you believe fundamentally in the value and importance of musical education. Yeah, for sure. I mean, El Sistema is one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen. Um, when I first went there when I was um, in high school still, um, in 2004, uh, with my youth orchestra, and I didn't know much about it, and went down there, and you know they, they took us after, we had a horrible trip of about 16 hours on a bus, because our bus broke down, and the roads were bad, and we got out to this school uh, where an orchestra of about 350 people played Tchaikovsky for and Beethoven wow. five for us. <laughs> and it was, one, the loudest, and two, the most incredibly exciting playing I think I've, I'd ever heard in my life. I mean, the, the hair on my neck was standing up for, you know, an hour straight. Um, it was really remarkable. Um, so, you know, as soon as I saw that, I was just so inspired by what they do. Um, and I think a lot of places are trying to ex import this idea of El Sistema because there's so many cuts in education by governments mm. you know, all across the world, um, especially in my home country, the U.S., mm. um, that arts educations really haven't come from private sources, which is really sad. Um, and I wish that it would go back the other way, but I, I'm, you know, I'm be fighting for it. But I, I'm, I have, I'm a little bit skeptical that it will come back. Yeah, really. Um, what can, what, what is the most important? Um, what can we learn in our part of the world? What can we take, transfer to our part of the world from El Sistema? What would be the most important? Well, I mean, I think a lot of the concepts, you know, are really popular in, you know, in, in Scandinavia and things like that, with, you know, kind of people learning in groups and, and being, you know, and they, they have 400,000 kids have gone through this program, so they don't all have private teachers. Many mm. of them, at, especially at a young age, they learn, you know, 20 people in a class playing scales together. <laughs> and then as soon as somebody is old enough or is talented or good enough to learn something, they then start teaching it to somebody younger than them. Um, so I think it, there's just kind of openness. And uh, I mean, in the Venezuelan culture is just so open and so exciting and so passionate. And I think that kind of, once they find something that works well, they really latch onto it. Um, I mean, Scandinavia always does so well with everything, you know, that I wish my, I wish the U.S. was more like Scandinavia. <laughs> so well, I don't you. know if you can take anything from El Sistema, but um, I, um, I think it's sure. everybody can learn from them, I think. Yeah. So it's kind of a mentoring yeah. uh, system mm -hmm. as well. Very, yeah, very much so. I mean, it, it was originally started as a social program mm. um, to get kids off the street. I mean, Venezuela mm. is sadly one of the poorest countries not the government is not as poor because of, they have so much oil but the people are very poor and um, it was originally started that way and now you know everybody wants in on it and um, so there's there's this it's it's really does act as a social program and also a point of pride for Venezuelans that they have this world-class orchestra now mm, right fantastic story yeah. and you do have uh, many reflections on how to reach out to our audience, young and old, and how to approach uh, new concert goers. Mm -hmm. What are your ideas? Can you share with us? Well, um, I wish I had something revolutionary to say, <laughs> I guess. But um, I think it's a combination of a lot of ideas that people have been floating around. You know, things like this, um, which I don't think would have really happened, you know, even ten or fifteen years ago. Um, mm -hmm. with, you know, interviews with artists, and um, I think the idea that we can sit in a concert hall in our tales and play the same repertoire over and over and in this sort of library-like atmosphere. That has to really go. Mm -hmm. um, and there is still room for that and there are people that love that and I don't, I don't want to chase away people just to try and get new ones. I think that's a mistake also. Um, mm. But I think repertoire and programming is really important to come up with interesting programs that often include contemporary music that people will like. You know, for example, the Vario that we're doing this week. Mm. Um, which I can't imagine any audience member would not just totally love. And that's mm. contemporary music. He died, you know, only 10 or 15 years ago. So um, I think that kind of stuff, reaching out to the audience, coming out of the concert hall, making things a little more casual, um, not glaring at people when they clap between movements. Um, I actually did um, a thread on a very popular site called Reddit once where I, I posted a question, uh, why do you want to come to classical music Why concerts? don't you come? Yeah, yeah. and the, the, the site is it's mostly men age 18 to 25, 18 to 25, that's the main demographic of mm -hmm. this, this site. And the answers were so interesting because 
this is a site that's visited by millions of people, and I got something like 4,000 responses, which I never thought I would get. Fantastic. Um, and most of them said they didn't understand the music, and they didn't feel like anyone was trying to explain it to them, and they felt like they were not welcome. And I think that that is, those were hmm. some of the main reasons, the other ones were about ticket prices and things like that, more things that we know about. But that really struck me, the, this kind of feeling that, you know, we have to welcome people and invite them in and also go out and reach out to them. Mm. Yeah, you think it's pl um, important to, uh, that we also change venues, play in, meet the audience where they are? Yeah, I think so. The Cleveland Orchestra does, they send their chamber music groups, like quartets um, from the orchestra to bars in the Cleveland area. And it's just great. They, um, it's, a you know, it's successful? It, it's very successful and, you know, it's very casual. It's a little bit like a uh, jazz club, like people are welcome to go in and out, talk and, you know, take pictures and put them online. And it just, uh, it's a kind of a, an outreach that, I mean, we tend to be very rigid and very resistant to change, partly because our audience is resistant to change. But mm. I think once we get, try to get new people in and sort of try to marry these two very dis distinct groups of people, I think it really can it's be wonderful. Is it really important to have young people in the audience? One of the conductors we have here often said, well, you know, our audience is gray. Everybody will turn gray, so don't worry. We will always have an audience. Yeah, I mean, I think he's right in a sense. And classical music has been, you know, people have said it's dying for 150 years. Um, mm. You know, there's a, there's a great um, article that showed um, every 10 years there's a article about why is classical music dying, and that's happened since 1890. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, there was a graph that recently came out that showed that every generation from that time period after age 60 there was a jump in attendance for classical music performances and the last generation this didn't happen so this was obviously very scary for everybody um, so I think that's part of the reason everybody's so intensely trying to get to young people um, who I think will love this music I mean I, I don't think the music is the problem I think the way we present it is and I think we have to find a way of presenting the music in an exciting and modern way um, to mm -hmm. younger audiences while also keeping the traditions and the, you know, the focus is on the music always. I think some people end up focusing on other things besides music mm -hmm. um, when, when they're trying to reach out to young people and I think that doesn't work because then there's no connection to what the orchestra regularly does. Yeah, I think you're so right. Uh, it's so important we show actually what we do. Yeah, I mean, uh, exactly. This is what we do. Right. <laughs> um, I mean, for example, there was a concert in, in New York the orchestra played. Um, a night of Pixar movies. Mm -hmm. uh, so the movies were project uh, excerpts from the movies were projected on screen while the orchestra played the scores from them. And you know, there were 2,400 people in the audience. You know, I would say 80% of them were in 25 and under. And that was great, but I thought to myself, that's wonderful and that's a great way of reaching out, but the next week they're going to come to a Mahler symphony and be like, what is happening? <laughs> so I think there's there's room for something in the middle, and mm. I think we, we can all be more open to that idea. Yeah, Yes, it's inspiring to listen to you. Oh. In Boston, <laughs> uh, you were a concertmaster of an ensemble called the Discovery Ensemble. Yeah. Do you still play? Does it uh, sadly, that orchestra folded um, due to financial problems, um, but I do still play the violin very, very poorly. <laughs> <laughs> I try to practice a little bit every day. Um, There's a little bit of a problem now with traveling overseas with my violin because of um, these rules the U.S. government put in about ivory tips on, on the bows, um, which makes it very hard. They can just snap your bow when you get home, even yeah. if you... you because you can't prove you bought it before a certain year. It's very complicated, and there's we're trying to work on an exception for for bows that have been made hundreds of years ago, but it's complicated. Mm. But um, when I'm at home, I try to practice a little bit mm. every day. Yeah, <laughs> but the Boston ans Ensemble, what was the mission of this orchestra? It was um, partly to replace this arts education that had been cut from inner city Boston schools. So we would play a regular concert, but before that, we would do workshops um, in inner city schools, Catholic schools in in Boston. And it was wonderful. We would do this little hour long concert for them where we played repertoire like Schumann Second, Beethoven Eroica Symphony, uh, the Mozart Jupiter Symphony we're playing this week. Um, mm. And we had these two amazing uh, 
writers and producers of these children's concerts for us and we would just do all of these different things introduce the instruments um, and then talk about the piece in a really detailed way and the kids just loved it I mean I remember we did um, the Jupiter Symphony and we talked about how many themes there are in the last mm. movement and at the end a kid ran up to me mm. who was about seven or eight years old and he said I can sing all four themes for you I mean if you want to hear want to hear and I was just like there you go that guy you know maybe mm. in 20 years he'll come back and be a fan you know yes. and so that was really wonderful yeah fantastic yeah hope we could do something like this here also with our orchestra and now to this week's program mm -hmm. why should everybody in Oslo come <laughs> to this concert and listen to Stravinsky, Berio, and Mozart. Well, number one for the orchestra, which is just so wonderful. I was um, telling Tora, a soloist, that like all of my friends who have kind of conducted here all say like, oh, I get to go to Oslo for the Oslo Philharmonic next week. Oh, they're so wonderful, and I, I feel the same way. So it's just, it's such a joy to be here. That's number one. Um, the, the repertoire also, um, you know, it's very wintry outside, it's very cold and snowy, and this is one of the, the happiest concerts I think I've ever done, the happiest programs. Um, this music is so joyful, and, and like these three composers are just like having a party with their creativity. Um, the Stravinsky with Polcinella, um, he takes music by Pergolesi and then just completely transforms it into his own. Um, and he actually made a joke that this is Pergolesi's best piece, Polcinella <laughs> Suite, which uh, it's a little bit of Stravinsky's humor with that, but the the piece is very funny, but very beautiful, um, and it really sounds like uh, kind of Baroque music with wrong notes in it, and that's it's just so wonderful. Um, and the Berio has the same idea. Um, it's these folk songs. Two of them he actually wrote himself, but he doesn't tell you that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. um, he took these, you know, from all different sources in the world. There's two from the U.S. There's some from Italy, from France. Uh, and then the final song is from Azerbaijan. Um, and th the creativity of his, the way he orchestrates them. And so they still ha they feel so authentic and so classical at the same time, which is just remarkable. Um, and they're also very funny. Yes, um, extremely the, funny. The, <laughs> the last song, uh, this Azerbaijani love song, is one that um, Kathy Berberian, who he wrote the piece for, she heard it on the radio and mm -hmm. wrote down the words syllable by syllable, but she doesn't speak Azerbaijani. So it sh the, it's completely meaningless, the words. It's mm. just gibberish that sort of <laughs> sounds Azerbaijani, um, <laughs> which I think is just hilarious. Um, and another song is about um, if, you know, you know, marrying somebody for really bizarre reasons or, you know, just they're, they're just all so creative and, and so funny. Um, and then finally, the Mozart, which is just, you know, maybe the great, one of the greatest pieces ever written. Um, just so much creativity, so much joy, so much beauty um, and the last movement is one of the most kind of amazing achievements um, Mozart always was war scared to write a fugue which is you know a voice is introduced and then another voice comes in on top of that one with the same theme while the first one develops the one that they just played and that's usually where it stops and Bach kind of took that to another level and mm -hmm. then Mozart was always very scared to do that and then he kind of comes up with a few with five voices, which is just astonishingly difficult to do, mm -hmm. and he makes it sound so beautiful at the same time. So, it's really like um, these three composers is just like experiencing genius on such an amazing level. It's hard to talk about, really. Yeah. No. So let's come and listen and uh, come to our concert. Yeah, please. And, uh, <laughs> we are really looking forward to it. Right. Me too. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 